My name is Bill Greenfield, and I used to own Wayward Video. Now, Wayward Video was ahead of its time, a VHS rental business that was accessed through catalog. You'd be given one catalog at the beginning of the month and had the option to order up to five VHS tapes for the entire month for the low price of $29.99. The tapes would arrive in the mail, and when your month was up, you'd send them back to Wayward Video. My entire business operated out of a small trailer in the small town of Gossamer on the edge of the Mojave Desert. It was just me, my cousin Johnny, and my dog, Gator. Gator was the brains of the operation, as most of the time Johnny and I sat around smoking things we'd find in the desert and shooting the shit. As far as our business, it was fairly profitable. I'd just receive the orders, go to my shed specifically built to store the movies, and keep them in good, cool conditions, package and mail them. Johnny would make the trek to town and mail about 10 to 15 videos a day. It was enough business to keep our lot rent paid and provide us with a nicer cushion of money than our neighbors in the trailer park. The other end of Wayward Video was the return of said VHS movies. Most customers rented the maximum five tapes, and sometimes you wouldn't get all five tapes back. Other times, the films would be damaged or taped over. Let's just say I saw a lot of personal things on the tapes I probably shouldn't have. On the hot desert nights, Johnny and I would sit in headquarters, our little air-conditioned shed that held our wares, crack open a cold one, and check the return VHS tapes for damage. Each one only took a few minutes, as we'd skip through fairly quickly, however we never missed a defect in the tapes. One grueling and hot night in the arid landscape, Johnny, Gator and I were up late, reviewing the week's return tapes. We had two different orders that had returned that day, the first being three children's tapes, and the second untouched and not examined. After sitting through the land before time, the never-ending story, and the last unicorn, my patience for the last film was thin. While it only took a few minutes, it never ceased to jar me seeing those movies zip by so fast like that. It always made me think, is this how God sees us? flashes of our defining moments, whizzing by and soon forgotten. I didn't like the thought. Well, Johnny, Gator, think y'all can finish up? That animated crap gave me a headache. I said with a yawn. Oh, come on, Bill. It's one more movie. You can't do one more out here with me? You know I don't like it out here on my own. Johnny protested, bushy blonde eyebrows curling up in slight anguish. You're not the one who's going to wake up and package all those dang tapes, Johnny boy. You'll be fine. Sides, you got Gator. In response to his name, the mutt looked up at me with his big brown puppy dog eyes. Gator whimpered as I reached for the last tape and examined the package it came in. The address wasn't from too far away. Most of our clients were from the southwest as we charged more based on the distance. I carefully removed the VHS tape from the package and read the label. Heathers. I'd heard of that movie at the time. Back then, I thought it was some chick flick about catty high school drama. Having seen it now, I was mostly correct. I popped it in the small VHS player hooked up to the microscopic box set TV we had in there just for the purpose of checking the tapes out. Have fun with this one. And don't worry, I won't tell anyone you like this kind of stuff. I said with a laugh, turning to leave. Screw you, man. I heard as I took my leave of the shed. As I stepped into the oppressive heat, I mused to myself about how well Johnny and I really were doing. Right now, our idea was still small, but we really had the potential to change the game. For the time, our service was way ahead of the game. There was no streaming and not everyone wanted to trek to Blockbuster or Mammoth Video every day for a film. I glanced at my shed, light from the movie screen slipping through the crack of the doorframe. The hum of the air conditioner doing its job satiated my need for peace and I made my way to my trailer. I walked through the hallowed halls of the bachelor pad sanctuary I shared with my cousin and descended to my haven. 
My waterbed called to me in a siren song and I stripped down to my whitey tighties and clambered in. Morning came, like a crashing wave to a serene shore, and I woke up feeling great. I did make note of the fact that my mutt had never joined me that night, but wrote it off. Gator, I called, hoping to see the hound bounding down the narrow hallway to my room. Nothing. I frowned deeply and got dressed for the day. When I was done, I went to knock on Johnny's door. His door was adorned with an employees only sign he'd stolen from a diner we frequented as teenagers. When no response to my knock came, I gingerly opened his door. The odorous waft of his room hit me before the realization that it was empty did. This was weird, and it set off an alarm. Johnny never woke before me, he was always up until 2 or 3 in the morning watching those personal videos we found, drinking beer and smoking whatever he found to his liking. Worry swirled inside me, like the bubbles in Johnny's lava lamp he'd forgotten to turn off. I must take a moment to emphasize how important Johnny was to me. Johnny wasn't just some cousin I had bunked with for convenience, he was my best friend in the world. His parents wandered off into the desert to get high on peyote when he was a boy, and never came back. My family welcomed him into ours, like he had always been there. Johnny had spent everything he ever earned or inherited helping me start Wayward Video, and despite his lack of hygiene, intelligence, or wit, Johnny was a good man to his core. I couldn't see Johnny getting up and leaving in the middle of the night for any logical reason, and where we live, that's not too bright of an idea. A thought struck me at that moment that put the panic to rest. The dumb drunk idiot probably fell asleep in the damn shed, and that's where I'd find Gator too. I sighed and set myself on the path to the shed. Approaching the shed, I took a moment to examine the exterior, as something seemed off about it. No hum. There was no air conditioning. That was strange because it was easily 110 degrees and I just could not see how Johnny could comfortably sit in the stuffy shed when it was that hot out. I trepidatiously turned the handle and cracked open the door. Johnny. Gator. Are you in here? I said in a hushed tone. The light of the open door did not illuminate much and it appeared as though the TV had lost power as well, because there was no light from that to show Johnny's whereabouts either. Get out, Bill. I heard it come from somewhere in the shed, however I had no idea where it was coming from. I heard a low growl next, and cautiously stepped back as I spoke. Johnny, are you guys alright? What's going on, man? Why is it so dark? My body was outside of the shed, and I was shaking with fear. Thoughts danced in my head and floated around. I breathed in the hot, damp air from the damn shed and prayed to God I got clued in to whatever was going on, and quick. I said out, Bill. I heard Johnny say as the shed door slammed shut. This was so out of character for Johnny. Even when he was mad as a hornet, he didn't raise his voice like that. The words he spoke were dripping with so much anger and hatred towards me too, I was simply bewildered. I then thought of my poor dog, that he could kill him and surely he didn't have any water. If my cousin wouldn't let me help him, at least I could help Gator. John, I need you to send Gator out. He can't be in there, he's going to need some food and water. In response, I heard the unmistakable growl of my dog, the kind of growl Gator used the one time a coyote was walking around our trailer. I huffed and stomped off, going back into my home. I prepared a small lunch for Johnny, for when he decided he was going to start acting like a person again, grabbed some bottles of water and some food for Gator. I grabbed the keys to our shared truck and headed outside. I set the items outside headquarters and knocked. Look man, 
I don't know what you saw or if it was the joke I made, but I'm genuinely sorry. I'm worried about you and Gator. I put some food out here, some water. I'm headed to town, gonna stop orders for the month. We can take a break from all this. Rest up, man. We'll talk when I get back. And with that, I trudged to the orange Dodge parked next to our trailer and left. Downtown Gossamer was only 20 minutes from our small trailer park and not too rough of a drive. However, it was separated by desert. Staring into the desert, some say you see things, but in all my years, I never experienced that. I truly believe that the empty landscape forces one to look within themselves and most folks would rather see little green men than deal with inadequacy. The cacti dispersed and led into small buildings, which melted away into bigger ones and soon I was in downtown Gossamer. I parked my truck in front of the post office, grabbed my ledger that lived on the passenger seat and headed inside. When inside, I wrote a newsletter to all 187 of my recurring clients, explaining that an incident at our warehouse would cause us to shut down operations for one month to complete repairs. While this was horse crap, I didn't want to tell them that my cousin was having some kind of breakdown. I made copies and sent them out to our mailing list. I then made my way to the bank across the street where I suspended all of the charges to my clients, much to the branch manager's chagrin. This would run me a pretty penny. Most of my customers would be understanding, but I was bound to lose business in all of this. Still, I could tell something serious was going on with Johnny and I knew I had no choice in this. Hopefully I'd be able to figure this out and get my business back on track. I finished my outing with a trip to the diner and I got a table for one. My waitress was a high school sweetheart of Johnny's, Sarah Jane. Where's that stud muffin that's always tied to your hip, Bill? She said in a flirty tone. Uh, well, sick, I suppose. I said nervously, not wanting to out Johnny as a budding lunatic. That boy could never hold his liquor. Tell him I said hi, won't you? Of course, Sarah Jane, anything for a sweet girl like you, I said, regaining my charm. The lunch was hollow without Gator and Johnny. I felt afraid, alone, and empty. Everything that was important to me looked like it might slip away, and here I was, eating my feelings in our crappy local diner. I had to find out what was going on with Johnny. I waved Sarah Jane over. Sarah, have you ever seen Heathers? The girl movie. She laughed a bit. Why, yes I have. Luann and I saw it at the Cineplex 10. It's not that much of a girl movie. What about it? Well, is it real messed up or something? I said cautiously. I wouldn't say children should watch it, but a big old man like you should be fine. What do they call it? PG-13? A couple people die, but no blood or nothing. Does this have something to do with your VHS store? Yeah. Um... I paused to think of a lie. This lady wrote me a letter saying it made her kid act weird. That's all. Well, then he was probably already soft in the head. The movie's fine. Don't feel bad. She said. That sentence made my heart sink. Was Johnny soft in the head? I didn't think so, but something was wrong with him. I finished my meal, somber and scared. Leaving Sarah Jane a hearty tip, I made my way to my truck and headed home. The desert called to me on my ride home, the wind howling and pushing against my truck. As I approached my trailer, I made note of the air conditioner loudly whirling from the shed and the items I had left undisturbed. Anger filled me as I ripped open the door to my truck and stormed to the shed. Johnny, enough of this, get out here, I said sternly as I approached. I didn't bother to knock, I busted right through the door and forced myself into the cool damp shed and smelled Johnny before I saw him. 
The smell was that of human and dog waste, topped off with the light nuance of sweat. The shelves upon shelves of VHS tapes were all torn down, tapes spewing out of them like a disemboweled cat. Our stock was completely destroyed. Then my eyes fixed to Johnny and Gator. Both sat in front of the TV, eyes fixed to every movement, and both of them growling softly as I approached. Slowly, I walked closer to them, the smell assaulting me with each step. I reached to Johnny, but before I did, his head whipped in my direction. Gone were the baby blue eyes, soft and gentle. Johnny's eyes were angry and bloodshot, his face pale and skin tight. It was as though in the day he had been in here, he had changed immensely, succumbing to malnourishment and looking as though he hadn't seen sunlight in years. Johnny's curly blonde hair was stringing and ripped off in whole chunks, his face covered in scratches as well. It looked like my cousin was wearing a goddamn Halloween mask. It was then I noticed Gator, his full multicolored coat now thinning, mangy, and red with bite marks. My heart broke seeing both of my companions like this. My eyes glanced to the TV. I needed to see what kind of film justified this. As I said, I have since watched Heathers, and I know that what was on that TV was definitely not a teen angst movie. The screen showed these images I will never forget. It was CCTV footage of a basement. In it, two people were chained up to a wall, a man and a woman. It took me longer than it should have to recognize the pair. Uncle Jamie and Aunt Margaret, Johnny's parents, the ones who disappeared years ago. Was this movie some kind of hoax? Someone sent in a movie pretending to be a customer to get a laugh out of us. I didn't understand where they could have gotten the footage though. None of it made any kind of sense to me. The TV emitted the screams of the couple, begging for help, crying and wailing. Then the screen went dark. And it appeared as though time had passed, as now Jamie had a beard and the pair both looked gaunt. Some thing entered the room. It didn't move like a person, and the camera couldn't really capture its movements. The creature went over to Margaret, slinking all around her, and she sobbed as it did so. She whimpered something about how they were hungry, and the creature laughed in a low tone the microphone on the camera could barely register. Jamie protested loudly as the creature dragged a talon-like finger down Margaret's shoulder blade and removed her entire arm from its socket. Blood gushed out of her empty shoulder, and Margaret gurgled on the spit from her own sobs. The creature took the arm and placed it before Jamie, and then unshackled him. Jamie launched towards the creature, but it dissipated into a gray mist and left the pair. Another dark screen transitioned into what must have been days later, because Margaret was gray and dead on the floor of the dingy basement, and Jamie was looking awful. The man aimlessly chewed on the last remaining bits of Margaret's arms, and with a shameful gaze, he looked to the camera and said, More. Another transition. More of Margaret was gone, and Jamie was even thinner, and his skin lacked any color. Much like Johnny before me, Jamie's skin was tight, and his hair was clearly ripped out. The final scene was Jamie, 
at the end of his restraints, screaming at the top of his lungs, looking nothing like the man I remembered from family gatherings. His eyes were massive, body completely naked, every bone showing, and his arms, his arms had elongated, now reaching the floor even when he was standing tall, and he used them to navigate the small basement. When he screamed, I noticed that his mouth was a perfectly circular hole, skin tight, revealing needle like teeth. The film ended with Jamie forming one sentence in a low raspy voice that sounded more like an animal imitating a man than an actual human being. Find Johnny. That brought me back to Johnny, growling and moaning as the movie ended, reaching an arm that seemed just a little too long to rewind the movie, and started over. Hey, come on man, let's go, I said as I reached for Johnny, desperate to get him away from that cursed movie. As my hand reached for him, Gator growled and lunged for my wrist, biting it hard. The dog seemed stronger than I remembered and dragged me down to the ground. Before I realized what was happening, Johnny too was on top of me, his flat teeth sinking into the soft flesh of my cheek. I could hear the flesh rip from my face and could taste the blood as it filled my mouth as I snapped into action. Self-preservation kicked in, and with my free hand I yanked the cord that powered the AC towards myself, knocking it from its perch on the wall, and down onto Johnny and I. It fell with a big old thud, and I heard a sick crack as it snapped something inside Johnny, some kind of bone. And before you judge me, no, it did not kill my cousin. It sure did stop him though, and it shocked the dog enough to get him off of me. I sprang to my feet, with one hand I grabbed Gator by the collar, and boy did he thrash about. With my other hand, I clutched my bleeding cheek and tried to stop the flow of blood. I ran from that hellish shed and into my truck, slammed Gator into the crate we kept for him in the truck bed and got behind the wheel. The engine came to life, and so did my dear cousin as I heard a screech and saw something with long arms, gray skin, and a taste for my flesh emerge from that shed. I heard Gator howling from the crate, and I heard monstrous screeching as I tore through the dark deserted roads leading to Gossamer. I could hear Johnny gaining on me, and I checked my rearview mirror to see two of those things chasing me. I swear to God, God, if you let me live, I swear I will never skip church again. Please, God. I rambled off prayers as I saw the outline of Gossamer in the distance. One of them let off a massive roar as it launched itself in the air and landed on the hood of my pickup truck, and it was then that I crossed over into downtown Gossamer. The thing turned around to look at me. It looked just like the thing that used to be Uncle Jamie, but honestly, it could have easily been Johnny. It spoke in that animal-like tone. We'll find you, Bill. And as it finished its sentence, my truck crashed directly into the post office of downtown Gossamer. I woke up to find the creatures gone, sirens wailing in the distance, and the sound of a barking, frantic gator. I prayed he and I would survive this, before fading back out of consciousness. I did walk away from all this alive, but not free. You don't get to have your cousin go missing and crash into the post office without some kind of repercussions. I told the cops it was meth. That was a lot better than telling them my cousin tried to eat me and disappeared with his father into the desert, probably to eat some other poor guy. 
Gator was all right from the accident miraculously, and he ended up shaking the mange and acting like a normal dog again, for the most part. I went away for a few years. While I was gone, Sarah Jane kept an eye on him for me. Gator was different though, skittish, anxious, and afraid to leave my side. I only did about three years in prison, but a lot has changed while I was gone. My company was long forgotten about, and no one would trust a meth head enough to do business with anyway, so it didn't really matter that much. My truck was gone, my trailer turned into an actual meth den, and even most of the surrounding trailers had moved on. After I was released from prison, the first thing I tried to do was track down Regina Fairway, the woman who had rented Heather's. I went to her address in Las Vegas only to find a condemned house. After a trip to the local library and a couple hours spent looking for any news on Regina Fairway, I found a newspaper article. Regina had been found in the desert, ripped limb from limb with no explanation for how she got there in the first place. The crazy part was, she was killed one day before everything went down with Johnny. I then returned to Gossamer with a succinct goal in my mind. I visited the site with Sarah Jane and Gator. I didn't want to go alone and she was the only thing close to a friend I had anymore. Also, Sarah Jane had her daddy's gun. I wasn't taking any chances. We approached the undisturbed shed and I spoke softly to Sarah Jane. If my trailer is a crack house now, why is my shed the same? I suppose it's kind of disturbing, really bad vibe coming from it. Sarah Jane said, reaching for my arm, clearly spooked. It looks like the police left it how they found it. I said, as I crossed the threshold. Gator whimpered and stayed at the entrance. I think he understood what I was looking for and didn't want any part in it. I approached the VHS player, unplugged it from the wall, and picked it up. This is all I needed. Shocked no one took it. Ain't nobody wants it. It's probably cursed, Sarah Jane said. I need to know if what I saw that night was real. And with that, we went back to Sarah Jane's house. We settled down, made sure all the lights were on and Gator was in the other room, and turned it on. The VHS booted up and the start screen to Heather's appeared. I didn't know what to make of it, and I still don't, but I knew then I needed to move on from Gossamer. I knew I would never understand what happened to Johnny. I said goodbye to my dear friend Sarah Jane a week later and found myself an old RV to travel in. I took to the road, truly wayward, for the first time. Some folks say you see things in the desert. I used to think it was because they couldn't process all of that empty space, so they imagined little green men. As I left the Mojave Desert behind, the wind howled alongside Gator, the cactus thinned out into sprawling empty land, and two creatures ran parallel to me off in the distance, watching me leave Gossamer behind. I haven't seen them since that night I left the desert, and now it's been 30 years. I'm still wayward. Gator is sadly long gone, but he had a long life with me. I never sought companionship beyond him, as I knew I'd have to live my life on the road. You see, every time I settle down somewhere for too long, I see my dear cousin and uncle somewhere off in the distance, and every time they get a little closer. They howl at night, demanding my attention. My name is Bill Greenfield. 
I am 54 years old and I am wayward. I have been chased by something that is now referred to as a rake and its daddy for 30 some odd years. I'm from a time before streaming the internet and all that. I've lived my life as a loveless vagabond chased by fear and inevitability. I'm telling you this because I'm done moving. Tonight I return to Gossamer and there I will stay. If Johnny comes for me, so be it. I am done hiding. Hey everyone, remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this story. And make sure to check out the author's YouTube channel, Creepy Collaborative. This was a really well written story and I had a lot of fun with this one. So a huge thank you to the author. I hope you all have a great week and that none of us turn into a rake.